Dave Snowden. I'm doing a PhD at the moment up at UNSW with NICTA. Um, and Eddie is working with me on this intelligent power management stuff that we're doing. Um, it's basically about uh, getting CPU power management to be a little bit more aware of the effect that it's having on the system power and the system performance and the amount of energy that it's, it's that you're actually using. Sorry, you were going to talk about this. All right. Um, the current implementation of CPU frequency scaling within Linux at the moment is well, it's called the CPU Freak subsystem. Um, you've probably heard of it. It probably runs on your laptop, um, and you've probably heard of the on-demand governor as well. Basically, the on-demand governor makes sure that the CPU runs at a speed which means that there's little to no idle time, so there's no wasted space in the CPU. Um, as we're going to show later on, this can have some effects on performance and can um, provide a suboptimal situation with the battery energy usage. Um, you want to go next? Sure. All right. So the assumptions that we're making is that um, power propor is proportional to frequency times voltage squared, and that's a pretty normal thing in the academic literature to go through and see assumptions like that. And that that ends up leading to the idea that energy is proportional to frequency squared. So. As, as we increase the frequency, uh, um, the amount of energy we're going to use to run an application goes up by um, the square of the frequency. The problem is it, it, there's a whole bunch of little effects which kind of complicate that situation. One is that, um, is that the performance obviously changes when you increase the frequency. So all of these, all of these things are, are kind of rubbish when you um, actually start taking measurement and, and start looking at what, what happens when you run in real systems. So this is, this is kind of your classic ideal case, the number of cycles, which is the red line. Uh, I'm just going to show a few graphs because these are all measurements that we've taken on real systems. This would have been taken on, uh, I think it's an IBM T43 or something. It's, we're talking laptops here, but the, the concepts are all applicable to embedded systems and mobile systems. So this is, this is sort of the classic case that everybody really sort of considers and designs for. We've got a constant number of cycles, which means that the amount of time that we take, so we've got a con this is frequency across the x-axis, we've got a constant number of cycles um, at every frequency, and as, so as we run faster and faster and faster, um, we have more cycles per second, and the amount of time we actually take to run the benchmark comes down um, with one on f. So what happens when you put memory and get memory involved? If you if you increase the CPU frequency when you've got a, a really memory bound application, um, you're basically just waiting on memory, but you're waiting faster and faster and faster. The memory still takes exactly the same amount of time to do everything, but you're waiting really fast, so you're using more more power, more energy. So the, the application still takes exactly the same amount of time to run. You can see that this green line really isn't changing very much, um, but the number of cycles is going up as we as we increase the frequency because we're spending more cycles waiting for memory. Then we can start looking at um, systems where you can change the front side bus frequency and the memory frequency, and um, this is on a uh, Intel X scale. Uh, and the lines connect points which have an equal memory performance, so have equal memory frequency. But you can see that the the the, the actual um, performance of the system is really quite non-linear; it changes all over the place. So. Um, uh, techniques like the like the one that um, on demand uses, which is look at the CPU utilization and basically keep the CPU utilization as high as possible by re reducing the frequency, don't really work in these sorts of situations. Then it gets complicated by idle idle modes. If we consider the system to have some sort of static power, some sort of power like say the LCD backlight that gets used the whole time, um, if we increase the, the the speed of the processor then um, the application will take less time to run and we'll actually be able to put our system into an idle mode earlier. So the faster we run, the quicker we get into an idle mode and the less energy we use all up, assuming the idle mode is really good. And I'll talk about that in a second. So on here, the blue line is the amount of energy, uh, you know, theoretical, but the amount of energy that a system would use just due to that static component of the power. And the green is due to the, um, it's due to the dynamic component. So it goes up as we increase the frequency because we also have to increase the voltage. If you add the two together, you can get a, a U-shaped graph, and so there's actually some sort of optimal where you can run, you know, at some sort of optimal frequency in the middle where you actually get the best possible energy savings. This is this is a graph taken on a real system. This is on an uh, Intel X scale again. Um, the blue cross shows the minimum energy point. The green line connects all the um, points which have the minimum voltage for that frequency. The extra points above have um, a higher voltage than what's really required, but I thought I'd put that in just to show you that this is actually a real effect. <laughs> 
And then what happens if you're going to go into different different idle modes? So these are four different idle modes. The, the top two are actual, actually measured, or the, they're all, the, the top two and the bottom one are actually measured. The bottom one assumes that you use absolutely no power when you're um, idle. And that's not actually such a silly suggestion because if you're going to actually do useful work with your idle time and you're actually going to do something else with the idle time, say you've got a 100% utilized system, then you really shouldn't be penalized for, um, for creating idle time because it's going to be using done, it's going to be used for useful work. Also, if you are actually going to run the system and then shut it down right at the end, you're just going to run a whole bunch of tasks and then shut it down after those tasks are done, then you really shouldn't be penalized for running, running fast. You're creating idle time on the system or creating, creating extra time on the system that can be used for useful things. So different C states, which are different level idle modes, you might have a high, high power C state, uh, uh, high, um, which is say C2, which is where you're basically you know, shutting down the CPU clocks. Um, I think you actually shut down the PLL, you do a few other things. Um, C4 shuts down more of the system, probably disables some of the uh, level two cache and that sort of thing. But depending on whether you're gonna go into one of these idle states, depend, really affects which, which frequency is the optimal frequency to choose. For if you're going to shut the system down, you're best off running as fast as you can because you're going to use no power while you're idle. While as if, whereas if you're going to be in just sort of C2, then you really want to the lowest frequency because your idle mode really doesn't buy you very much. It's really not a very good idle mode. You're not going to save much energy. So depending on which C state you're going to end up in at the end, can change which frequency you should really be running at. And that was taken on a Dell Latitude. That, um, uh, yeah, on a Latitude. Temperature can change things. We can, as, as the system gets warmer, the static power increases because the leakage current in the processor increases. The fans use some energy just to cool the system. So you can see that the green, red, and blue points are different fan speeds and they're in pretty you know, reasonable steps. That's all just running multiple iterations of gzip on a, on a T4, uh, no, on a Dell Latitude. Um, you can see that there's some curves in those lines, so it's not even a linear relationship between the cycles and the number of cycles and the CPU frequency. So there's some um, effects with prefetching and um, and instruction, um, just instruction level parallelism, how much instruction level parallelism you get out at different frequencies. You can get these nonlinearities. Um, this is this is my favourite one. Well, I, I'm just I'm just sort of throwing things out there that we came across which made these, these curves look really funny. But in, inside the Dell Latitude, there, there's a voltage converter which goes from the battery voltage or the, or the AC adapter voltage down to whatever the CPU voltage is, maybe 1.3 volts or something like that. So maybe it goes from 12 to 1.3. That, that converter, the converter that, that's in there, its efficiency depends on just how much power it's, is going through it. So if you step from, I think it was 1200 to 1300 megahertz when the processor was at a certain temperature, yeah, so, you, sorry, you go from 1300 down to 1200 when the processor was at a certain temperature, you'd actually get an increase in power because the efficiency in that DC-DC converter was, uh, the decrease in the efficiency of that DC-DC converter was enough to, to in increase the power used. Um, okay, so it's just a bunch of random stuff that the, really the, the, standard, um, the standard relationship, the idea that energy is just proportional to, um, to voltage squared really doesn't hold. And so we really need something a little bit more um, intelligent to manage the power. And so that's what we've been coming up with. Okay, so um, what we'd like to do is build a couple of models. One of the execution time as you change the frequency of the CPU and another of the dynamic power or the, the power that the CPU uses in a certain workload as we change the frequency. Um, we use the Linux time slice um, to determine when to make these frequency changes and we take measurements of uh, certain performance counters in each time slice and then use these models to um, bas basically estimate the um, energy use at a particular frequency. Um, we pass the, the values generated by those models into a selection policy which chooses the best frequency to run that particular time slice at. So these are the two models. Um, the execution time models basically um, on the latitude and the T43 we've got two performance counters we can use. So the model is based on those two performance counters that we choose and two coefficients. And the power model, again, based on the two performance counters that we choose, plus the um, dynamic power there given by FV squared. So performance counters are usually things like level two cache misses and um, 
and that sort of thing that, that changed the amount of that changed with frequency. So it, it sort of indicators of how um, how memory bound a, uh, a task is, and that gives us an indication of how it's going to change when we how it's going to how the performance is going to change and how the power is going to change when we change frequencies. Yeah. So this is an example of one time slice for um, a memory bound workload. You saw swim before on the graph. So the two performance counters there have taken two numbers. Um, you can see now we've calculated the estimated performance drop and the energy that we um, use at each frequency. And you'll note that the optimal frequency is in fact not the lowest frequency, but the um, somewhere in the middle there at about 1,200 megahertz. So this is assuming that you go into a really really low power, like basically zero power sleep state. Yeah. After the, um, yeah, so after we, bas we basically run the benchmark as fast as possible and get it to finish at the, at the different amount of time at each frequency. So now that's basically got, once we've got the estimated energy for a particular time slice, we need to pass this into a policy selection tool. Now this graph shows the energy usage for swim over the various frequencies on one of the servers that we tested on. Basically I'm showing here that under minimum energy policy, the blue cross is where we'd want to run at. Um, you'll note that at 1600 megahertz, the energy usage is about the same, probably a little bit higher, which is why it's chosen 1000 megahertz over that. But we lose a bit of performance by dropping down 600 megahertz. So the minimum energy policy has some issues which we'd like to iron out. So we'd, we'd, we'd like to choose 1600 as opposed to 1000 there so we don't lose any performance. Uh, the existing infrastructure in Linux would basically like to limit the amount of performance hit that we get. So it's basically a maximum degradation policy where you pick a, a certain point at which you don't want to lose any more performance. So you can see along the bottom this is performance setting. So as you go back, we're willing to take more performance hit to try and save more energy. Um, and above the red line is basically where you want to be, where the, the models should predict. And here we're showing the energy that we save as we, or the energy that we don't save as we go down for that performance setting. And you'll see some workloads, the memory bound ones, which do save energy when we scale, do in fact save some energy. Whereas the CPU bound ones, as we scale down the performance setting, we actually use more energy. So, so what we really want is something, and I'll just go back to this graph for a second. These are actually taken in Koala in our, in our infrastructure, um, and it's a policy inside our infrastructure. And what, the, what we would really like to be able to do is say, say to the system, okay, we can deal with a 90% performance hit, and then our applications, all of our applications will run at 90% performance, and we'll get the energy saving. That's the idea behind, behind this policy, and it's been implemented in some academic literature. Um, the problem is, you, if you, you will always get that, that performance degradation, and as long as it's possible to get that performance degradation, you'll always get it. So for CPU bound applications, you'll definitely get, if you, if you run at half the frequency, you'll definitely take twice as long. But you won't, get, you won't necessarily get an energy, energy saving. So you're running at half the, half the speed with, that, with, with no benefit whatsoever. What we want is something that's generic. We want to be able to give one number to the system one number to the system um, and, and, have that, and have every application, we want to express to it how much we value performance versus the energy savings that we're, we're making. And this is what we've basically come up with. If we, if we minimize eta in this equation, then we can express a few different policies and we can change the policy just by changing alpha in that equation. <coughs> So if we put a zero in, if we make alpha equal to zero, then we end up with eta equals p times t, which is energy. So we get a minimum energy policy. No worries. If we, t if we call alpha one, then we get um, eta equals t squared. And if we minimize t squared, then again, we get, um, min we maximize, we minimize time, so we get maximum performance. So we get, we can vary, we can change to one, and that gives us a maximum performance. We can also put it somewhere in between. So if we set to 0.33, then we're basically saying that uh, we're basically making eta equivalent to minimizing um, energy times time. And if we do that, then if we get a 10% performance hit, we'd expect at least a 10% energy saving, if that makes sense. <coughs>
So if we get a uh, yeah, if we get a 10% performance hit, then we have to have at least a 10% energy saving. Otherwise, it won't bother choosing that frequency. Otherwise, it's better just to have run at the maximum. So that's minimum energy delay, and then we can vary in between zero and one in order to get everything from minimum energy to maximum performance, and that'll apply to every every benchmark equally. The last one that we think is kind of cool, and I don't think anyone's really done this before, is uh, a minimum power policy in this, by using the same number. So if alpha is minus one, then you can go along and tell it to go minimum power. And you might want to do that for thermal reasons, if your system's overheating or something like that in a, in a data center or something like that. So it's probably not quite so applicable to mobile devices, but certainly to um, systems in big data centers. All right, so here's some benchmarks that kind of show what we're talking about. This is a CPU-bound benchmark. And if you look at alpha on the right-hand side of zero, um, the red line, which is the performance, you can see that it, it's 100% performance the whole time. We don't, even if we got alpha equals zero, then we got 100% of our performance. We don't lose any performance for anything down to minimum, minimum energy. Once we start going left of zero, the performance does come down, and you can see, and that ba that's basically because it's reducing the, the power consumed. It's scaling the system right down in order to save the amount of power that's used, um, uh, dissipated in the CPU. Minus one, zero. Sorry, did I say zero? Okay, I mean minus one. If you go right down to minus one, then you're at minimum power. But it, the energy used actually goes up because, because on this system, we're assuming that the system goes to sleep after we're done and it goes into really low power mode. So we save energy by doing that. So because we're running slower and slower and slower and slower, we're actually using more energy. You can also see that we, have, we, save, we don't really save any energy either. Like the energy stays at 100% the whole time. Now let's compare that with a memory bound benchmark. You lose some performance at, at, at um, alpha, equals, alpha equals zero at minimum energy, but you also save about 10% of the energy on, on that run, in, when running that benchmark. So we can, we can basically use alpha to vary from maximum, maximum performance to minimum energy to minimum power. And we can do that in a generic way for all programs right the way across the board. So we think it's kind of cool. So you might use that in a feedback loop, kind of like, um, kind of like on demand does with it, it measures the utilization and, and tries to keep the utilization really high. If you have lots of CPU time available, then you could potentially reduce, down, reduce your alpha down to zero. Um, and when you, in times when you don't have so much CPU time, you could increase it up to one. Okay, so we're going to talk about next. Just a, a few implementation details now. Um, basically, we write a kernel module for Linux 2.624. Um, we call it Koala. Um, we basically put a hook in the context switch method which pulls into Koala, where we perform calculations to generate the numbers for the models. Um, we determine whether or not we're going to do a switch for that particular time slice and then store the numbers that were generated by the models for some accounting and to pass the user space, which I'll show in just here. So in the PROC interface, we provide lots of information about what the models are calculating online. And the dev interface shows um, every context which what frequency was chosen for every, every time slice that ever happens. So I'm going to move on now to the sorts of information that we can get out of the system at runtime. This basically shows some of the raw data and some of the massage data that we can get out of the PROC interface for each, t for each um, process. Sorry. So number of switch opportunities, that's basically number of time slices, the number of switches that we actually did, um, the accumulated setting, energy used, energy used at the maximum frequency that we estimate. Um, I think I'll move on to something a bit more interesting now. We um, modified the Linux top command to show us some information about the processes that are running. You can see here the K setting, which is the average setting that this process is running at. That's actually just an index into an array. So the lower the number there, the, the lower the frequency. We also show the estimated energy saving as calculated by the model. And you can see again, swim the memory bound benchmark that we're running there is saving about 7% energy at this point. We modified GNOME system monitor to show us the um, current setting that each process is working at in a graphical way. So you can see there the, the setting is moving up, up and down all the time. Here are just some numbers that we took from our server platform. This is using the minimum energy model, sorry, the minimum energy policy. And you can see for various benchmarks around the um, this spider plot, um, the amount of performance that we lose. 
this is the energy that we're gaining, also that we're saving from the minimum energy policy. Now I've added the 90% performance policy there, and as you can see, we don't save as much energy and we um, lose some performance as well, but no more than 10% perform 10 performance. Now I'm showing the um, energy delay policy, which Dave spoke about briefly, where alpha was 0.33. This is where we're expecting to get the same energy saving as we get performance at, so not 10% performance at gets 10% energy saving. And as you can as you can see, we lose significantly less performance with this policy, but we get similar energy savings. So that's a much better thing than minimum energy. And these are just some numbers. So basically, we can save up to 10% energy on, this, on, the, on the benchmark swim and 7% energy on MCF. So I guess what we, the, the way we went about all of this work was to implement and to take a huge number of measurements on a whole bunch of platforms. We've actually gone along and taken energy measurements at various frequencies on about 10 different platforms and they all ranged from um, things like the X scale and uh, on a couple of different platforms plus uh, an IMX like uh, other ARM based boards. Um, and Intel Atom based board, Pentium M, right up to servers like the Xeon and AMD64 that we, and we saw the numbers for the AMD64 a little bit before. So we've, we've tried it on a, on a bunch of different platforms and we've seen a whole bunch of quirks in those platforms which we talked about before. And I guess what the, the, w the message that we have is that, that getting this um, trade off between performance and energy right is actually really hard and it's totally non-intuitive. There's, there's so many things to take into account that it's very difficult to do it. But what Koala allows you to do is separate out that, that concern and say that if you can build a model for your system, if you can model how much energy the system is going to use and how the performance is going to vary, then you can make a decision, by, uh, make, you can make a decision about um, which frequency is the best, the best to run at. And building models for, if you, if you, you want to hand build models, we've got various techniques for building those models, but, um, then you, you, can, you can generally build a model for how your system is going to use power and how it's going to perform. Um, the other thing that we really found was that um, expressing your sort of performance desires in terms of frequency isn't very useful because the performance isn't necessarily related to frequency in the same way for every bit, uh, workload. And um, expressing it in performance isn't very useful because you don't necessarily get the same energy savings for um, every performance setting on each benchmark. Even if you're running a memory-bound benchmark, you can't just say, I want to run everything at 90% performance because in that case, you're kind of going to lose 10% of the performance on some benchmarks for no purpose whatsoever. So we came up with Alpha, and um, Alpha basically lets you express all of these policies and how much you care about performance and how much you care about energy savings in one number and it's workload agnostic so you can it, you can express the same number for every workload so we think that's kind of cool and um, lastly we've got a uh, there's a conference paper that'll explain all the details of how we implemented this and all that sort of thing and it's going to be in one of the systems conferences which is coming up so I think that's all we have to talk about Um, no, it's not merged into the kernel. It's all pretty experimental. Um, we've been doing work up in our lab. It needs a uh, few things need to be looked at before it would be really ready for prime time. Um, one of them is um, things like multi-CPU support, and Edian's going to be working on that over the next year or so. Um, uh, and, and the other thing that would need to be taken into account is the way things like DMA affect the memory performance. So if you've got varying levels of DMA in your system, then it'll affect the memory performance, which will affect how memory bound your benchmarks are. So some of those things are actually quite tricky to model, and it's quite tricky to predict, for example, how much um, how much DMA you're going to get in your next time slice, and whether whether it's going to change. And it's 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 things like that that we haven't really looked at. So the models need to be the assumptions that we've got when we made the models have to be relaxed a little bit. <laughs> Um, switch over, yeah, we have actually just been working on that at the moment. The numbers aren't up here, but basically if you add the, the way we're doing it at the moment is adding the time for the switch overhead into the time model. So when we generate the time, the, the performance at each, each individual setting, you can model what the switch overhead is to switch in from the present frequency into each of those other 
um, set points. And when you do that, you can, you, it basically gives a bias to the present, present frequency, so it improves the performance of the present frequency versus every other frequency in that table. So and it, that, that carries on to the energy model as well. Well, with the, uh, the, w the model that we have, actually, we've got a good model for the, um, for the PXA, and so that actually works quite well. You, you basically introduce, we have, um, we can introduce other terms for the various frequencies in the system. And it's not just memory, you can have a front side bus frequency. So on the X scale, there's a, there's a, there's a like a, a internal peripheral bus, and the memory controller is on the other side of the peripheral bus. So in that case, you have to account for that frequency as well. And in the PXA, it's actually really important to do that, because the, um, it's impossible to change CPU frequencies without, well, it's difficult to change CPU frequencies to the full range of CPU frequencies without changing your memory frequency or your bus frequency. And we, we measured the overhead of the frequency switch and it's actually relatively small compared to the length of the time slice. I, so more, I was more thinking of certain embedded devices which mm. everything's off the one clock and some of those are your audio clock or your USB clock that literally require you to flush your entire audio buffers mm. before a switch and that could be many milliseconds worth of Audio yeah. It seems like the, the newer the hardware, the better the yeah, switch. Yeah, the newer the better, but you never know what yeah. you're going to run into what bizarre hardware designers. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess that's, I guess that's what, what, what it's all about here, because there's so many quirks with all the, I mean, we came up with all this stuff because we were working on these platforms and realised that, you know, there's so many quirks about these platforms that you can't really, um, you can't really take into account easily. Yeah. My power, I said the power management, that, that power, the efficiency of the um, DC-DC converter to the, that, that, that's, that, that took me a month because what happened at that point is we were running it off the AC adapter and we were converting from the AC adapter, which is at 19 volts down to a, um, it con had converts from the AC adapter down to 1.3 or something for the CPU. As soon as you change over the battery volt, so that the, the, the bat running off the battery, it's only at 12 volts, and that, it's the same converter which converts from 12 volts down to 1.3 volts. So in order to, we actually worked around it, so we don't actually, what, what we were doing was measuring the power at the AC adapter, and then we were getting these funny effects in these curves, and all these curves looked terrible. Um, as soon as we changed it, we then had to work out how to instrument the battery in order to, um, and instrument the battery in order to measure the power coming from the battery. And as soon as you measure the power coming from the battery, because since it's converting down from the lower voltage, the um, efficiency of the converter stays constant. So if you measure at the battery, it's okay. But then, of course, you have to deal with all the quirks with the battery monitoring system, which is inside the battery.